Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled A Non-Invasive Alternative to DPDT Max Peak Aortic Blood Acceleration. This is Martin Hess from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. We are looking forward to an exciting session today sponsored by Indus Instruments that will focus on using non-invasive blood flow velocity measurements as a surrogate to DPDT to quantify both cardiac contractility and cardiac relaxation. We will also touch on some other example applications including coronary flow reserve and pressure overload. Our speaker for today's webinar is Dr. Anil Reddy, Assistant Professor of Cardiovascular Sciences at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Since 1997, Dr. Reddy has been developing Doppler and physiological signal acquisition and processing systems in collaboration with Indus Instruments, many of which are currently being used in his lab. Dr. Reddy's research interests include evaluation of cardiac and vascular mechanics in senescent, disease, transgenic, and surgical models of mice. Using non-invasive methods in his lab, he phenotypes animals as abnormalities develop and progress, and monitors the cardiovascular system as it adapts and compensates for either deterioration of function or for missing or overexpressed proteins. The main goal in Dr. Reddy's laboratory is to translate what is learned in mice to humans for early detection and screening of vascular diseases. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for that nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the uh, webinar today. Um, today's presentation will be on the evaluation of uh, cardiac contractile and relaxation function using non-invasive blood flow velocity measurements. Um, I'm going to start off with the presentation outline. Um, I'm going to do a brief uh, uh, description of methodology uh, in the interest of time. This was uh, discussed last in the last webinar. For those of you who haven't attended that, uh, there's a link for that as well. Um, but I will touch upon that. And then I'll move on to the applications, mainly focusing on the cardiac systolic function and uh, to uh, uh, complete uh, the discussion I'll talk about other applications. I um, want, to, want to mention this uh, up front uh, some of the advantages and the main advantage is it's non-invasive so pulse Doppler also non-invasive allows for serial studies and uh, with the with respect to just the Doppler system that I'm going to talk about, it's a short signal acquisition times, uh, can measure at uh, various locations, and it is possible to achieve small angles. If you look at the probe here on the right, it's very small, so you can maneuver it to uh, lowest possible angle uh, when it's uh, in line with the blood flow. Um, one of the things that uh, we need to have is knowledge of the anatomy of the cardiovascular system uh, uh, and the shapes and timings of waveform. These are available plenty, um, will be provided. But uh, keep in mind this is not an echocardiography system. That means there's no image guidance uh, to find out where the signals are located or where the vessels are located. So this part of know-how becomes important and this is usually provided during training. Moving on, um, I want to say why it's needed uh, is the first question. We all know that uh, and from the poll also we've seen the rodents are animals of choice in basic research. Um, they undergo genetic, surgical and pharmacological manipulations and this result in cardiovascular system. And uh, so we need cardiovascular phenotyping. And uh, since we know that most uh, cardiovascular measurements and parameters are functions of time, we need to get waveforms. And we need to get these waveforms non-invasively because uh, invasive, again, uh, I'll be emphasizing the invasive, non-invasive nature quite a bit. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, we be non-invasive. Uh, I'm going to jump into the methodology. Um, briefly. Uh, so here is a quick look at the picture. We have a Doppler probe placed on the skin 
um, of the animal with a little coupling gel or even water will work in times. And uh, a pulse is transmitted and you have a window uh, that is along the, uh, the path of the sound pulse uh, where we can listen to. So that where we dial in uh, actually places the sample volume in that location. So we can move the sample volume across the tissue from the tip uh, to the um, uh, the vessel. And uh, this distance typically is about uh, one centimeter away. And then this continues and uh, this resulting signal is processed and displayed as, uh, as waveform. And uh, the conversion is the frequency shift that uh, the, um, the probe detects is converted into velocity using this formula. Keep in mind co cosine theta influences the, uh, the velocity, peak, peak of the velocity. So the smaller the angle, the more closer you are or the more uh, less error in the estimation of peak velocity of Doppler. So with that concept in mind, um, one of the questions that arises is why do we need blood velocity? And uh, this brings up the scaling part in mammals. Uh, the general scaling across mammals from elephants to mice, uh, humans, somewhere in between, um, you can use uh, the general uh, allometric equation. It's defined by y equals a times body weight um, to the power, to some power, depending on the parameter measure. As you can see here, uh, most of the parameters are functions of body weight, and they change accordingly. And this is these numbers are given for mice. But if you look at the last three arterial pressures, aortic, not only aortic, but any blood flow velocity, and pulse wave velocity, which is the, the pulse that travels from the heart to the, uh, to the periphery, uh, this pulse wave velocity, is, they are all independent of body weight. And, uh, but in this case, arterial pressure is non-invasive. And so the only other parameter is uh, velocity, which is, uh, I mean, sorry, arterial pressure is invasive, and the only other pressure is aortic velocity, which is non-invasive, and which will allow for serial studies. So we will focus on that. This is a typical Doppler system, uh, uh, and combined with a, a temperature monitoring system. Um, here you can see a typical setup, you know, you have the mouse anesthetized, taped to the electrodes on the board with a probe held to the uh, xephoid process aiming towards the ascending aorta. You can see the signal on the screen and uh, save and move on. So what does the board do for you? It's essentially is used to maintain anesthesia, monitor ECG, whether it's uh, mice or similar sized animals or rat or similar sized animals on the outer electrodes. Uh, we can monitor body temperature, um, maintain board or body temperature and perform also non-invasive measurements like the Doppler or it's also useful to measure, uh, do uh, surgery and um, perform invasive measurements as well. So we'll move on and again I'm emphasizing the challenge is to be non-invasive, we discussed that. But the next challenge is that uh, mice and similar sized animals, they are small and the distances are short. And they are, have high heart rates, that means the times are very fast. So the next set of challenges is to acquire signals with high spatial and temporal resolution so that we do not lose out the information uh, that uh, these animals provide. So with that in mind, I will start moving on to the applications. The main focus of this presentation will be cardiac systolic function. And for the sake of completeness, I will be talking about the other applications that are related to cardiac function. So here is uh, the waveform of uh, a cardiac cycle in a mouse. Uh, we deliberately uh, used ketamine xylazine here to slow down the heart rate to show the timings really clearly. Uh, here is the valve clicks where you see the um, mitral valve closure 
uh, and then aortic valve opening, ejection phase, relaxation phase. Uh, this is the contraction phase right here. Relaxation phase, um, and then you have a mitral valve opening, early flow velocity, and uh, with the P wave coming in to get the atrial uh, stimulation and the atrial uh, flow velocity and uh, the cycle repeats. And if you look at this, the magnitude and shapes of the inflow and outflow velocities in mice are very identical to those found in humans. With that, I'm going to specifically focus on the cardiac systolic function. And how do we get this in mice? Essentially, anesthetize the mouse, you uh, put the probe tip at the xephoid, just under the xephoid process, aim towards the ascending aorta, and so that the sample volume is around the valve area. You can see a little bit of the valve click, and that's uh, what you want to look for when you're trying to find um, the signal at the root. And what do we do with this? How do we anal analyze this? Basically, we're looking at timing information. There is the pre-ejection time, uh, there is the uh, ejection time, and then this is the time to peak. So what do we use this timing is basically you get the peak velocity divided by the timing that gives you mean acceleration. And if you take the slope of the line of the upslope uh, of the rise, that is the peak acceleration. Um, so we can derive several parameters out of this set of signals. Um, there is a, a post-analysis from which uh, you can get heart rate, pre-ejection time, rise times, ejection times, and all these parameters, timing as well as the peaks and accelerations are useful um, under various conditions. The stroke distance is area under the curve and that we can use that and if you can estimate the aortic diameter using that you can uh, estimate cardiac output also um, in this price. So I will move on to the, uh, the contractility and relaxation part, uh, essentially focusing on the contractility. So if you were to put a catheter, this is an invasive pressure catheter into the left ventricle of a mouse uh, cannulated through the right jugular, right carotid artery, um, and you can get a nice uh, uh, left ventricular pressure. And this is uh, what is called the gold standard in terms of determining the contractility, is taking the first derivative of this pressure waveform to get a positive DPDT maximum value of that and uh, maximal negative DPDT. And these two numbers uh, define the relaxation, contractility and relaxation aspects of the, um, of the myocardium. Um, there are some um, investigators who would go uh, put a catheter through apex also, and that's another method of doing um, the DPD, DPDT measurements. So with that in mind, this is considered the gold sign. With that in mind, this is, uh, uh, this is an invasive procedure and we can only do this once in a mouse because as if we try to uh, retract the catheter or we already closed the car carotid artery so that changes physiology and as you re retract the catheter uh, there could be valvular damage or even the vessel damage and uh, that will not be physiologic for future studies so with all this in mind um, there have been several instances in literature where even in large animals and people, there have been attempts to uh, get uh, a surrogate, um, so-called surrogate, for the uh, to replace uh, their DPDT measurements, which are invasive. So this was done in dogs. This is an example uh, where d u is the velocity. Uh, aortic velocity and then uh, if you take the derivative of that you get acceleration and this was multiplied by rho density of blood and pulse wave velocity c uh, 
to basically have same units on uh, equalize the units. And as you can see, the uh, correlation is uh, excellent. Um, uh, they found that the correlation was excellent between the two parameters. There were attempts in patients uh, uh, with other methods. Uh, here is an example where the aortic velocity, peak aortic velocity was squared and it's divided by the time to that peak uh, that I talked about earlier. So from the start to the peak. And uh, this was compared to uh, DPDT. And you can see that uh, it was uh, had good correlation, uh, but this was not done under uh, various loading conditions for obvious reasons. Um, and moving on, another example, this is in sheep. Um, I, this is a different methodology again. Uh, here, the pressure volume loops from conductor catheter were used, and the slope of the uh, slope of these uh, pressure volume loops at uh, dif uh, different conditions were used um, as uh, is the maximum elastance, and that was compared with aortic acceleration and in this case the time to peak the peak value divided by time to peak was used and comparisons were made at several different con uh, conditions uh, baseline uh, infusion of blood angiotensin nitroprusside and a special case of cor coronary occlusion was used and as you can see that the data is uh, well correlated between the two measurements. Um, they also report uh, uh, a good correlation between um, the uh, acceleration and LVDBTT, but didn't elaborate on it much. So you can see that um, there was attempts in, uh, in literature in the previous uh, studies to derive a non-invasive measurement of uh, LV contractility um, and uh, even in large animals. Um, in, so we went ahead and said, okay, we should be uh, able to do this in mice as well. And uh, where we put a catheter in, this is a, a pressure signal from um, the one French Millar catheter placed in uh, the LV of the mouse. And this is the Doppler flow probe. Uh, that we used, and uh, we tried to line up the two signals as much as we can uh, using vi visually. And uh, this can be adjusted. Again, this is from outside, non-invasive. Uh, once the probe is in place, we can get this measurement. We can adjust it to uh, get uh, as uh, close as possible to the aortic root. And if you take the waveforms the, uh, of these two signals, and take the first derivative, you get a nice uh, DVDT waveform here. This is a peak acceleration. And here is the positive DPDT, negative DPDT. Now, if you uh, observe this, this one is peak acceleration, not mean acceleration. Mean acceleration was measured by taking the time from the, st uh, the start of the waveform to the peak which is around here, and dividing the peak by the time you get mean acceleration. With that, we did comparison of peak acceleration, and we got a highly correlated waveform. And we also looked at mean acceleration, and I will show why this is also relevant. And this also had a very high correlation. So whether you're looking at peak acceleration or mean acceleration, we do get high correlations. Uh, this was done at baseline and with dobutamine, um, uh, IP injections of dobutamine. Uh, moving on, this is, I wanted to show some examples where acceleration, without this validation, acceleration was used in some of the studies in mice to show the differences uh, in contractility. So here is an example of wild type and APOE knockout mice, where the baseline, at baseline, the peak velocities were elevated in the knockout, uh, APOE knockout mice. And accordingly, the peak acceleration was significantly elevated as well. 
uh, no difference was found in the mean accelerations of these two um, uh, in these two groups of animals. With uh, dobutamine um, stress responses showed that the uh, APOE responses were uh, relatively muted compared to the responses of the wild type animals. And the key thing was that mean acceleration showed uh, this uh, difference, whereas uh, the peak acceleration should, did not show uh, differences in this particular st uh, study that was reported. So you can clearly see uh, that uh, the, because of elevations at baseline, um, the responses to stress uh, were muted. That means the cardiac function reserve was already used up as baseline and didn't have much uh, left uh, for stress responses. So very nicely shown here with the uh, mean acceleration. A uh, few other examples here. Um, here is a, a group of animals where uh, in the Desmin uh, knockout mice, uh, could see that uh, uh, contractility was uh, compromised. And uh, this was uh, restored uh, with uh, the BCL2 overexpression in this group of mice. And uh, so this shows very clearly that uh, you can use not only the peak velocity um, uh, as uh, an indicator, which is usually used as an indicator of cardiac output, uh, uh, and uh, also the mean acceleration as a contractility uh, function. Uh, looking at mean, this is another example uh, where uh, where the contraction is um, uh, contractility is restored after uh, AMP activation uh, in aged old hearts by injections of ACAR. So you could see significant elevation. Uh, or restoration of function in terms of mean acceleration. So moving on, another uh, study. Uh, this is uh, uh, SRC2 uh, knockout mice. Uh, these were subjected to pressure overload and it showed significant difference in the contractility uh, compared to wild type mice. As you can see, this is of course peak aortic velocity and looking at mean acceleration, you can see there's significant differences between wild type and knockout mice. And I'm going to show a few of the aortic velocity examples where, uh, where uh, one could have also used the mean um, acceleration or peak accelerations to show um, the differences. So here is uh, an example of uh, um, mice infected with encephalomyocarditis virus and this causes a decline in cardiac uh, function and uh, with after treat after treatment with a pre uh, uh, pre pretreatment the contractility or the cardiac function is restored to normal values. Uh, here is an example of uh, KLF3 um, uh, missense uh, mutation in this KLF3 gene caused aortic valvular stenosis in this group of animals and uh, uh, also resulted in cardiac hypertrophy. This uh, results in a huge increase in peak aortic velocity. Um, you're looking at this and right here compared to the wild type mice. And uh, and because of the stenosis, you would expect a non-flexibility of the uh, aortic orifice, a uh, valvular area, you could see huge uh, jets, sort of uh, jet velocities coming up of the, uh, at the root of the aorta in these mice. And so if you, and looking at this, we already saw the mean accelerations in this group of mice as well. And so for these two groups, you could say that if you one were to measure uh, the uh, either the peak or mean accelerations, you would see significant differences defining the cardiac contractility uh, function in these animals. And uh, finally, uh, I wanted to show the uh, different uh, aortic uh, 
outflow velocity from different uh, strains of mice, starting with uh, young um, deterioration in the old mice. Um, uh, calorie restricted doesn't seem to help the systolic function. Uh, enhanced contractility in young hyperthyroid mice. Um, CIS2 with the enhanced IGF at one year of age is almost uh, similar to the normal mice and uh, little dwarf mice have diminished uh, peak aortic flow. This seems to say, uh, stay like this throughout their lifetime. These actually live 30% uh, longer than their wild type litter mates. Uh, as you've seen in the previous uh, studies, APOE uh, peak velocity in the APOE mice is elevated um, and uh, uh, of course in the angiotensin 2 mice uh, after six weeks of administration we see huge velocities um, uh, as well. So in all these cases you could one could use uh, uh, peak or mean accelerations to define the cardiac contractility. To continue with the diastolic function but just a brief mention um, uh, regarding uh, uh, getting aortic uh, flow velocities and one of the things that uh, I had mentioned uh, in the earlier part and repeatedly throughout is the angle uh, measurement and uh, this is critical in assessing the peak aortic flow velocity. We have to keep the angle very low. Uh, typically the uh, angle should be less than 15 degrees to make sure the errors are very low in assessing the peak aortic velocity. Um, this uh, because at uh, higher angles even the angle corrections can, uh, can may not be sensitive to those changes, uh, subtle changes that you have seen in the peak aortic velocity. So keep with that in mind I will continue with the the diastolic uh, function and so as you've seen earlier the uh, uh, the probe uh, was oriented to catch the uh, the flow from aortic outflow here and all you have to do is shift it to the right of course these all these come with some practice and typically most of uh, the people learn this in within two weeks one to two weeks of practice and so you can place the sample volume in the um, near the mitral valve uh, area and get a nice looking mitral signal and uh, with this location we always see a little bit of aortic outflow in fact this will be useful in determining the timing and uh, this waveform actually can be expanded as you can see in the next um, slide here so as we uh, the screen can be changed, the sweet speed, and uh, so that the timing is uh, can be obtained. So you can see it's 161 milliseconds of R to R interval. Very clearly being able to demarcate where the timing is. So with uh, the mitral inflow waveform, we can get several timing information. Uh, basically, this is the isovolumic contraction time, isovolumic relaxation time, and uh, several other uh, timing information related to the mitral inflow waveform. And, uh, and uh, you can see the valve opening and closing in these. And uh, with that, with those parameters, we, we can, with those uh, markers that you've seen, uh, we can get uh, the timing information, the acceleration and deceleration timings. So these are useful in very, under various conditions. Uh, that uh, of diastolic function. But uh, one of the key things that we will look here is the E to A ratio, which is uh, sort of considered uh, a non-invasive gold standard to uh, determine the relaxation function. And uh, so here you get early flow and uh, mitral flow. Looking back at uh, some of the animals that we looked uh, at earlier, young mice have a nice uh, high uh, E to A ratio with age uh, and stiffening of the heart muscle. Uh, you get a, a, a lower E to A ratio um, or relaxation. But uh, interestingly, uh, the 
restricted calorie didn't improve systolic function, but it seems to improve the diastolic function in these animals, in the old animals. Um, again, enhanced contractility uh, shows a higher E to A ratio uh, in young mice. Uh, one year old cysts, two mice, IGF uh, with the enhanced IGF-1, you could see clearly the systolic function of these guys was uh, almost normal, uh, but the diastolic function is deteriorated. Um, the dwarf mouse, again, uh, is, uh, it's got a very uh, low E to A ratio, but this is in young dwarf mice, and it continues like this throughout its lifetime. And same is the story with the special case of naked mole rats. These guys live 30 years, and uh, they have a, a diminished E to A ratio, but this occurs at two, age, uh, two years of age and continues until uh, almost uh, their um, death at uh, 28 to 30 years. So here is a good summary. Of course, uh, there are other conditions that uh, will influence this, so one has to keep that in mind. But that's a topic for another uh, uh, day. So we'll move on to coronary flow reserve. Um, uh, one of the uh, key things to remember in coronary, they are very small and they're close to many other vessels, uh, aorta and several other uh, um, uh, vessels in the heart. And they move along with, with the heart. So most other vessels don't move uh, from their location, but with the heart moving, uh, you will see that the coronary also moves. So it seems impossible to get something like that without the image guidance. However, we can you place a probe in a in a uh, micro positioner, uh, and with it uh, unlocked, we can position the probe to find a trace of the signal. Once we find that, we can lock it and use the micro positioner to adjust the position to get a beautiful looking signal. And by the way, this is not the best one. This, this is among all the best ones that one can get uh, should they use this uh, micro manipulator. So coronary flow by itself doesn't uh, help us much. Uh, so we need to measure something called coronary flow reserve. This is very commonly measured in clinical studies. Uh, before and after uh, a bypass surgery, for example. And uh, uh, the, 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 the drug that's used is the adenosine triphosphate, and that's what is used in clinical training people to get coronary flow reserve. In mice uh, we, that are anesthetized with isoflurane, isoflurane is also a potent coronary vasodilator. So if you reduce the amount of isoflurane from a standard 1.5 to 1, coronary flow, is a, uh, flow velocity goes down to a very small value, which can be considered as a baseline. Uh, and if you increase that to 2.5%, uh, uh, then the flow goes increases dramatically. And so if you take the peak velocity ratio, the low and high, this is called a coronary flow reserve, and we can use this to determine what's happening with the perfusion in uh, many different cases. So I will, um, uh, you can also use ATP, but keep in mind that if you're using isoflurane to anesthetize your animals at one and a half, the flow reserve will be compromised and uh, any effect of ATP will be diminished. So keep that in mind. Uh, you can use some other anesthetic if you want to use adenosine phosphate to get your flow reserve numbers. Moving on, uh, just to show some of the data that uh, we published in the past uh, in young mice um, at, at three months and two year old, and uh, and as you can see, the as the age increases, the baseline flows actually settle down to a very low value whereas the hyperemic values stay relatively same and you get 
shows in, improved CFR in mice. This doesn't happen in people because most of the time it's measured in um, uh, people with various uh, cardiac conditions. And if you take something like this and uh, uh, add with the disease, the coronary flow reserve drops. Uh, this is uh, with uh, stenosis occurring in the coronaries of APOE mice. We would expect this to happen. Uh, looking at the uh, uh, third application, one of the most common applications used in many labs. Um, um, and here we look at this model here. Um, uh, stenosis is placed to create a pressure overload model. This is uh, to um, bring out the frame type of uh, any genetic manipulations that were that affect the heart or in various disease conditions, other disease conditions. So after placing the band, if you were to measure uh, carotid artery signals from the right and the left carotid artery, this is done non-invasively after the surgery, after closing up and after the animals recover. You can also do it during the surgery if you want. Um, so here you could see a significant increase in the right carotid velocity and diminished uh, uh, flow velocities in the left carotid on the distal side of the um, stenosis. And if you were to measure at the stenosis, uh, you can get a huge uh, uh, stenotic jet velocity uh, by and using approximate Bernoulli's equation, which we validated in this uh, publication, we can uh, estimate that uh, pressure gradient to be about 75 millimeters of mercury in this particular case. Um, and uh, so the use of left and right carotid arteries and also stenotic jet velocities is important uh, because we can figure out whether we have a loose band or a tight band. As you can see here at baseline, uh, pretty much equal left and right carotid arteries. Um, with a loose band, you have diminished left carotid artery velocity, but then the sh shape is still maintained. A tighter band would essentially diminish that and reduce that uh, flow to a minimum. Keep in mind that when we do averages of this uh, average velocity of this, pretty much the average velocity is maintained with very few differences between the left and right. Um, and you can see the pressure gradient increase with, with the tighter band. And so this is a good indicator of uh, uh, how to group your animals uh, in, when doing comparisons. Uh, here is an example of what happens to the coronary flow in a pressure overloaded model. So at baseline, you have a nice high uh, uh, flow reserve. And uh, at one day, that flow reserve drops to 1.7. And in 21 days of banding, that flow reserve is completely compromised. And so no matter what uh, amount of isoflurane that you use, even beyond 2.5, we tried and it doesn't, it actually brings it further down and uh, doesn't help us much. And so uh, looking at, uh, this is the last slide I wanted to show uh, as to, as the pressure gradient increases in this mice, uh, coronary flow reserve decreases. So we can use, uh, this is all done non-invasively with Doppler, very nicely showing uh, the differences between uh, uh, both uh, uh, the uh, baselines and uh, post-treatment. Uh, With that, I would like to summarize uh, the talk today. Um, Doppler system is uh, non-invasive, allows for serial studies. Um, measurements uh, can be made at very small angles. You can measure at various locations and the short signal acquisition times and analysis will allow you to get uh, results faster. One of the things, the key things is it replaces invasive measurements for, especially for cardiac contractility where uh, signal uh, studies can be terminal. And uh, also want to emphasize that it, this is not echocardiography, there is no image guidance. 
And uh, we have uh, looked at the cardiac systolic function, uh, aortic flow velocity and contractility, um, and the cardiac uh, diastolic function uh, with mitral flow velocity and how we can um, quantify relaxation. Uh, looking at myocardial perfusion index, that's coronary flow velocity and uh, flow reserve, and a pressure overload model. And uh, I'd like to conclude that, uh, you know, there are several other models uh, of cardiac function, uh, whether it is fibrosis models or uh, myocardial infarction models, we can get these indices. Uh, non-invasively and uh, quantify uh, these groups. Um, with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, the uh, my faculty collaborators and uh, collaborators from other institutes and uh, our uh, technic technicians in the lab. Um, Thank you very much for your attention. I will be glad at this point to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mark. Very good. Thank you so much, Anil, for that excellent presentation. Um, I hope that our audience found that as informative as I did. We are going to start our Q&A session now. We have about 10 or 12 minutes, and I would encourage everyone in attendance to please Feel free to send in questions for Dr. Reddy using the questions panel, and uh, we'll, we'll try and get to as many of those as we can now. And again, those that are not addressed live will be answered following the event. All right, so Anil, for starters, you've, you mentioned a couple of times in your presentation that the Doppler flow velocity system that you presented today can measure very small angles. Can you elaborate on what that means exactly and why that's so important? Um, yes, and uh, it's uh, one of the things that I always, it's harder to explain without visuals, but I will try to do my best. When you have a Doppler, for, for those of, uh, that uh, know about the Doppler systems, it's very uh, clear, but uh, for those of you who are not, uh, familiar with that is that when you have a Doppler uh, pulse uh, beam or the line of uh, Doppler uh, pulse lined with the direction of flow, whether it's coming from opposite or towards, whether the flow is occurring towards the probe or away from the probe, it doesn't matter. As long as the angle of that beam is below 15, your errors run into like 3% or something like that, which is within physiologic variability. But once your angles go above that, the because of the cosine function in being in the denominator, your angle uh, are going to, the errors are going to be uh, exponential, increase exponentially. Now this is error in estimating the peak velocity. So if you use angle correction, and if you use angle correction within 15 degrees, your errors are going to be very small. Uh, and it, it, most of the time, it doesn't matter if you, need, if you do that uh, correction or not. But when your error, when your angles are, let's say, in the 50s, 60s uh, degree, and you're trying to make a correction of five degrees, and if you're off by that much amount, your errors can be 30, 40% in estimating peak velocity. So at these higher angles, the uh, estimations that you make may not be sensitive to any smaller changes that may occur, uh, depending on the uh, condition of the contractility of the heart. Uh, and so the, uh, what I will try to do is uh, put an image in the question answer session uh, later on. That way, this makes it much more clear. Okay, perfect. So if I understand correctly, the small size of the probe allows you to achieve that smaller angle, ultimately yes. meaning less variability in, in, in the data. Exactly. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. Perfect. We've, we've had a... Um, a handful of questions asked in different ways, but really I think what 
various people are trying to understand is how one goes about positioning the probes, knowing where measurements are being taken from, I guess, without mm -hmm. any image guidance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Um, we typically, for example, uh, as I showed in the uh, figure, for cardiac uh, function, we go from the z uh, from below the z uh, aiming straight, and so you can almost uh, uh, put the probe almost flat on the belly of the mouse, um, and of course, adjusting you, it's most of the time handheld. But for stability, we can use the micro positioner and keep in place. Usually, that we use that for monitoring uh, a before and after situation in acute uh, measurements. Uh, you know, for example, if we, uh, in the case in the case of validation with the W to mini uh, IP injections, we did that, where we place the probe in the same location without changing its position, so that we can get a relative before and after position positioning of that. Um, but most of the time we do this uh, handheld and we go the left aorta aim towards the um, right ear uh, of the mouse uh, as shown with the mouse in the supine position. I mean, um, and, uh, and if you turn the probe tip oriented a little bit to the left, towards the left ear and kind of uh, uh, aim towards the mitral inflow. So we try to keep it as flat as possible. Now, um, uh, it, same thing goes with the other peripheral vessels like carotid arteries. Now, if you are doing just comparison of peaks, uh, as long as you maintain a certain angle, uh, if you're doing a ratio, then it should be okay. But uh, you have to try as much as possible to uh, decrease that because most vessels, in almost all the vessels in the body, on the major vessels I'm talking about are almost horizontal. So if you try to bring your probe down as close as possible to the horizontal, uh, you can get a pretty good uh, uh, estimation of peak velocities. Okay, perfect. That answered the question. <laughs> Um, I, I would I would imagine so, and perhaps along the same lines, uh, mm -hmm. Alejandro has asked uh, specifically about how one would orient the probe to look at uh, mitral or diastolic, uh, mitral mm -hmm. flow or diastolic function. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, as I said, uh, uh, mitral flow velocity, there are two locations that you can use. Uh, you can go from the zephoid. Uh, we prefer zephoid uh, from the zephoid uh, uh, because that's a, a location that you cannot miss uh, when you're going from animal to animal. Uh, you can also go from uh, the side uh, in between the ribs and get that, but then you're not consistent putting at the same location every time you come back you may find another rib you know uh, between the third or fourth rib or fourth or the fifth rib you can find that so for consistency we always go from the z for below the z void and aim straight towards the mitral inflow of course there's going to be a little bit of uh, angle issue there um, but that's consistently the same all the time and uh, so when you're doing comparison across groups or species, you're still getting the same um, uh, same numbers uh, or, you know, assuming that the function is not different in a, within a group. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, ho hope that uh, answers uh, uh, the question. Perfect. Okay, um, a question from Max, and I'll just read it verbatim. The, the question is, how do you set the source of the signal? He says that in echo, one sets an area of measurement. Uh, is there an adjustment of, of depth or something like that that needs to be made for acquiring this type of signal? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Is uh, Basically, when you take a probe, and we know more, 
with experience that for cardiac signals, when we go from the xephoid process, those are the farthest from the tip of the probe. Like I said, our probe can uh, measure signals uh, from up to a centimeter depth from the tip of the probe. So when from the xephoid going to the heart, uh, the cardiac uh, aortic outflow signals, uh, we get them typically from uh, in the range of 6 to 8 millimeters, uh, and we do have a range control um, on the Doppler system. Uh, and I also have a remote attachment that uh, you can use by hand. And uh, basically, as you hold the probe or if the probe is in a position, you can control the range as to where you're sampling. And depending on that, you can adjust your probe accordingly uh, to that depth. Uh, for example, for the mitral, when you move the probe towards the mitral, my mitral is a little bit more proximal to the tip of the probe, so now you reduce the range. Uh, to the five to six millimeter range uh, in you. And you, one has to be careful when you're pushing against uh, the skin. If you push too much, uh, trying to find the signal. And if you, once you find the signal, try to ease back a little bit so that you're not uh, interfering with the function of the heart, the normal function. And pull back and then adjust your range to see the signal. So uh, you can physically push it, but then you want to pull it back once you found the signal to uh, use your range control to go to that depth. And the rest of the signals in mice, uh, peripheral signals, they are all within three to four millimeters of depth. Um, and so uh, including the abdominal aorta. And so okay. um, the cardiac is the only one that's farthest. Now, in larger animals like rats, uh, uh, comparatively, uh, the the depths are a little bit deeper. So uh, you had to go. You can go from suprasternal large to get the cardiac signals. Um, uh, but the, most of the peripheral signals are within uh, reach. Uh, OK, perfect. Hopefully that answers uh, your question, Max. And if not, note that uh, Dr. Reddy's email address is shown on this slide, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind communicating with you directly uh, if, if sure. you have more Yeah, no, no problem. Please, please send me questions. OK, we have maybe just a couple more minutes. Um, there, we, we have many more questions to ask. But like I said, we'll try and get to, uh, we will answer them all after the fact. Let me ask you this, Anil. Matthew is curious to know if pulmonary flow velocity profiles have ever been used to try and study right ventricular function. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the things that, um, as I mentioned, uh, in uh, the entire vascular system, if you look at most of the flows, uh, the direction of flows is almost horizontal, except one, that is pulmonary, um, um, the uh, pulmonary artery that, you know, it's, uh, it starts off from the top of the heart and dives straight down. So that's perpendicular. The interesting thing is that a ascending aorta and big becomes descending aorta and it wraps around sort of around the pulmonary artery. So if we use the Doppler probe and if we go vertical to the so that we can catch pulmonary, we can be catching a aortic signal at an angle and that diminishes its peak to almost what the peak velocity of uh, the pulmonary artery would be. So with the Doppler probe, that was one of the only signals that we are not totally sure if we are getting the right pulmonary signal. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is to see if we can individually control these two, but you know, because of the preload, afterload conditions, we cannot quite uh, change that. So if you were to change the uh, uh, the uh, uh, flow velocity in the uh, pulmonary artery, it could affect uh, 
ascending aortic uh, flow aortic flow velocity and so with that being said it's one of the difficult measurements we can definitely do the the bicuspid uh, on the right side uh, but you know, flow velocities the uh, the mitral equivalents on the right side but uh, not the pulmonary artery so we are in the process of trying to figure out if we can uh, make that measurement uh, more definitively but at this point uh, no yeah okay thanks for the answer it sounds like it's challenging but it's uh, something that uh, it's a work in progress yeah. uh, okay I, I would like to add one last i don't know if you have um, more time for the question but very quick thing for those of you who are uh, working with large animals i'm sure you have some questions regarding this the Doppler technology we have right now it works in smaller animals because of the depths being one centimeter. But for the larger animals, uh, the, the processor part of it, not the Doppler part of it, but the data acquisition part of it can process Doppler signals from larger animals. And if there's a, a system that uh, you, you can generate the audio signals and feed them into the uh, Doppler uh, acquisition, uh, it can process and give you pretty much uh, use it in similar fashion. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Actually, I was going to ask because um, somebody did want to know if the same system, perhaps the same probe, can be used for measuring Doppler flow velocity in rats. And I think the answer is, is yes. Yes, yes, uh, we can measure in rats and uh, similar sized animals. And as long as the, the, the depths are within uh, uh, one centimeter, the vessel depth, so we can measure. 